I think there's room for a lion in uh, the circus room at the block party, Tom. <laughs> so our sermon series this fall, we're following Jesus through the Gospel of Mark and uh, on the road with the disciples and thinking about what that means for deepening our spiritual life with God. And today we come to the ninth chapter. We're reading just the second verse and then skipping to the end. So I invite you to hear the word of God. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, which as you know, Jesus did many times in his ministry. He would go off and pray, take the disciples with them, take, take time apart. But then after the transfiguration, which is a story we read on another Sunday, uh, Jesus and the disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way, they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down and called the twelve and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Shauna. Sometimes I think, what would it have been like to 
to have followed Jesus on the road, up the mountains, on the way. And that's a beautiful song. O Sabbath rest of Galilee, O calm of hills above, where Jesus knelt to share with thee the silence of eternity interpreted by love. What would it have been like to have been there, to have heard the master in his own voice? So much of the gospel is about that, is about Jesus and the 12 on the way. The way means road, but it also means something more than just the road. They're on the way. That phrase comes up more than once in the gospel. Jesus and his disciples on the way. So there they are, they get to hear Jesus, they get to hear right from his lips what this is all about, what life is all about, what really matters. And yet when they come to Capernaum, they're arguing. And what are they arguing about? About who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? You're there listening to Jesus talk about giving his own life up for the sake of all. You're listening to all the things Jesus says and yet you're on the road talking about who's the greatest. Still trapped in their one-way thinking. And then Jesus offers them sort of a living parable. He takes a child, and he places the child right in front of them. And in those days, you know, a child was, you know, better seen and not heard. Uh, sometimes you had children so that you, for insurance, so you'd have enough kids to take care of you when you were old. You know, children were not... Uh, perhaps looked at in quite the same way as we look at a child. He looks at a child who puts it in front of them and says, well, if you don't welcome this child, you don't welcome me. And whoever welcomes this child welcomes me, and not only me, but you welcome the one who sent me. Here, a child, the least, the least of all, who only, you know, takes resources, doesn't yet give them, not yet old enough to provide anything worthwhile, yet this child who in many ways the least, if you welcome this child, you welcome me. Now, in our society, we, of course, say we look at children differently, although I did read the Time Magazine cover story last week that said our teachers in our country uh, talked about how underpaid they are, several stories of teachers, one who works three jobs and donates blood regularly for money in order to pay her bills. So maybe we don't value children quite as much as we think. 20% of children in our country go to bed hungry, not knowing where their next, for sure, where their next meal will come from. That's like 20%. Let's see, we had 10 kids up here for the children's time. That would be two of the 10. Whoever welcomes a child, in my name, welcomes me. So. Jesus is looking for teachable moments where he can not just teach them, but where they can do more than just listen, where they can somehow internalize what it is Jesus is saying. So they can somehow, it can become not just something they hear, but it can become part of them. So they can hear the truth that Jesus speaks, the truth that Jesus lives, but not just hear it, not just see it. They have to somehow make it their own truth or else it's really not, not theirs. How does that happen? How do they make the truth their own? Well, today we're talking about seeking solitude as a way of making Christ's truth your own. We're talking about not just having a soul, but tending it. Maybe, first of all, finding it, then feeding it. We're talking about building our spiritual life. And we've been talking, using the, the definition of John Westerhoff, that the spiritual life is ordinary life, everyday life. But it's lived in an ever-deepening and loving relationship with God. And because of that, a relationship with our own best selves, with each other, with the, the creation. And you know, all the spiritual practices of the church, all the things the church has taught for, year, for centuries, prayer, reading the Bible, meditation, the daily examine, and on and on and on, all the, the spiritual practices we talk about, they're meant to do that, 
to create a habit where you deepen that relationship, where you grow your soul. How can our souls deepen, though, if we give them no time? How can our souls deepen if we give them no solitude? If we give them no opportunity for reflecting, for wondering, for considering the bigger picture? How can our souls deepen if we sort of let the truths that Christ offers us just sort of hang out there? We're sort of aware of them, but we don't really make them our own. But time is so short, and many of us are not all that good at meditation, those kind of things. Can we really afford the time and the energy and the effort it takes to seek solitude? Can we afford not to? Can we afford not to take time to integrate our deepest beliefs, our highest hopes, our greatest aspirations, to really not take time to integrate them into who we are? Because just reading a book about them doesn't do it. Just hearing a sermon about it doesn't do it. You know, my parenting philosophy, I have, you've, some of you have heard me say this, that my parenting philosophy was always, you do what works to get you from this crazy moment to the next crazy moment, no matter what the long-term repercussions. <laughs> I need to cook dinner, I'm gonna put a video in because that will do it so I can go do dinner. And you know, if you do that once, okay, but if I do that every day, what's the price? The price might be that all your kids end up like trying to do films for a living or something. <laughs> So I joke about that, but there's a lot of truth in that, that that, you know, that was my, my great approach for parenting. Fortunately, I married well, and Car Kathy's approach to parenting is much better than mine, much more intentional, and I learned, I learned, I was paying attention, I learned things. But that matters, taking time to reflect and think about, well, who do I want to be as a parent? How do I want my kids to turn out? What can I do, and this works with adult children too, what can I do that will really help to continue to shape them the way I really want them to be shaped and will not just get me to the next moment? I remember uh, the couple who showed up, in my, the husband, I should say, who showed up in my office one day. Uh, he was your classic John Wayne type, strong, silent type, you know, a rock, but not good at feelings at all. And of course, you know, who did he marry? He marries a woman who wore every possible feeling on her sleeve. And you could see where the attraction was there, each of them looking for something they weren't particularly good at. But you could also see the danger. And he was there because of the danger. You know, she knew who I was. You know, she, she knew me. She, she, she knew what she was getting, and yet she had left. She had walked out, and he was devastated. Devastated. He didn't think it could have happened. He thought everything was, was okay. He thought this was sort of their deal. And there he is sitting in my office, devastated. And then he says to me some of the saddest words I've ever heard. He said, you know, it just wouldn't have been that hard to have given her what she asked for. It wouldn't have been that hard for me to make her, make her happy. Well, there's, there's a happy ending to this story anyway. They, they, he, he figured out a way to do it. They weren't just words. He figured out a way to do it. And they now have two kids. And, you know, they still are who they are. But they also have a new, a deeper understanding of who the other one is. And they, they do the things that you can do to make another person happy, even if they aren't the things that particularly make yourself happy. So taking time, though, taking a little time, and that was a forced solitude for him, but he made the most of it to decide to be a different person, to be the person he wanted to be rather than to just figure the person that he was would be good enough. Your children, your marriage, your friendships, work relationships, all those kinds of things, all that is soul work. It's all soul work when you get right down to it. Everything affects our soul. It's, there's no religious life and then the rest of your life. No, it's all the religious life. It's all about your soul. But we get up the same, caught up the same way the disciples do. We do. 
I mean, it's all about, soul work is all about paying attention. You know, if you never hear a sermon, never read a book on the spiritual life, the whole point of the spiritual life is pay attention. Pay attention to your own life, to what's happening in it. Pay attention to the people around you. Pay attention to that mysterious presence that gives us life in the beginning and that calls us home at the end, but wants to have a relationship with us all along the way. Pay attention. Just pay a little bit of attention and your life will be different. That's the whole, the, the spiritual life in a nutshell, is pay attention. But we get caught up like the disciples do. We get caught up in what the world tells us is important. We want to be the greatest. We want to be the favorite child. We want to be the highest paid employee because we think all those things are the things that really matter the most and will make us happy and will satisfy us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The world has a different standard than God's standard. Whoever welcomes this child welcomes me. God has a different standard. Some of the time we barely see the difference. We don't notice the difference. And even when we do see it, we still have to internalize it. We have to make it our own. We have to make God's truth our own. Henry Nouwen, the great writer of the spiritual life, said, only in silence and solitude can we learn the important lessons that being is more important than having, that our worth is more than our efforts, and it's not the same as our usefulness. But we'll only really make that our own if we find a way to be, to be silent, if we find some kind of solitude. You know, the whole idea of grace, that we're loved not for what we do, but for who we are. Do we really know that? We hear it, but do we know it? Have we made that truth our own? Have we integrated it into who we are? Hope. I mean, we, we live in this terribly dangerous world. But do we really trust that the God who is our beginning will also be there at our ending? And that in the end, in the end, as always, we will belong to God. Love. We know that God loves all people equally. We know that. We say it all the time. We sing it all the time. But do we really treat everyone as a beloved child of God? No matter what their political party, no matter what their language they speak, no matter what neighborhood they live in, no matter what, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, do we treat everyone as though they, each and every person is a beloved child of God? We say it's true, but we have to integrate that and make it part of who we are. Faith, do we really adopt the values of Jesus? That we don't, we don't need to look out for number one. We need to look out for the least, for the child. That winning is really about being a servant. To do that, we need some kind of solitude. Some kind of solitude. And you know, some of us are better at solitude than others. So I'm going to suggest today that maybe solitude isn't, isn't necessarily just a daily walk alone on the beach, although for some of us that would be the perfect solitude. Solitude may not be a daily time of prayer at, at 10 p.m. before you go to bed or the first thing in the morning. Although for some of us, that will be the perfect solitude. We just need to be aware, though, of filling up our solitude with words. Some of solitude means quiet so that God can work on our souls in a way that, that, that God only knows. But seeking solitude depends on what works for you. To seek solitude is to create some kind of space in your own life in whatever way works for you, where you can be open to the mystery. The great mystery that's behind all life that when we put it into words, we only, only describe it. The great mystery of life that's within you. The mystery of the life that's been given to you. The mystery of the lives of the people who are around you. The mystery of the life you feel you really ought to be living but haven't quite been able to live yet. 
the mystery of the fact that there is a power and a presence beyond all things that wants to connect to you, wants to have a relationship with you. The mystery of what God might say to you, not so much in words, but in an intuition, in awareness, in a creative thought, in a new aspiration or a new calling, some kind of a sense of what you should do. And you won't ever hear it if you don't stop the craziness and give yourself a chance to listen. How will you create room in your life to make, to make God's truth your own? Otherwise, it's the loudest voices that will claim your loyalty. And the loudest voices in our world do not lead to a life that's really worth living. At least, not until the loudest voice comes in an intensive care room or a funeral home or a treatment center or a judge's decision, or your spouse's apathy, or your child's silence. And you really don't want to wait until that's the loudest voice that you hear. So finally, how do you leave room in your life for a word that you're not expecting to come from God? How do you do that? I want to tell you a little story because the truth is, you know, we preachers talk all this stuff, but some of us preachers are better at this than others too. And I am not good at this solitude thing. I am not good at reflection. I'm not good at making time to do that. I have too many things that need to get done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Five years ago, I preached a zombie sermon. I think I preached a version of it here a year or two ago when we were talking about movies, why there are so many zombie movies these days. It's crazy. And I suggested the fact that there are so many zombie movies is because it speaks to our fear that we are the living dead, that we're going through the motions, that we are not really fully alive, and we know we ought to be and we're not, and it scares the heck out of us. I thought it was a pretty good sermon. <laughs> An elder came up to me and said, that sermon changed my life. And you know, it did. I saw things in his life that changed. A teenage girl, high school girl, happened to walk into church that day, said, I never thought I would hear a sermon about zombies in church. Three months later, she was baptized. She'd never been in a church before in her life. She was baptized. Again, I thought, this is a pretty good sermon. <laughs> Part of the sermon was at the end of talking about zombies and stuff, I said, quoted Mary Oliver, the poet. Any of you know Mary Oliver? And she, one of her one of her wonderful lines is this, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? What will you do with your one wild and precious life? Well, my elder asked that question, and he answered it, and he changed his life. This teenage girl walked in and decided she wanted something different. She changed her life. And something started nudging me and saying, hey, have you asked yourself this question? Have you asked yourself what you want to do with your one wild and precious life? I didn't really want to ask that question. I'm actually, some of this will surprise you, I'm actually a pretty conservative person. I think you have a job and you do it. You're in a place and you stay there and you work hard and you, you, you keep your nose to the grindstone and you go. But something kept nudging and pushing and saying, you need to ask this question. What do you really want to do with your one wild and precious life? We were in a church that we had loved. We'd been there 20 years. We knew all these folks. We had wonderful friends there. And the truth is, I could have coasted there into retirement. What will you do with your one wild and precious life? You know. We had this wonderful family next door, these adorable little kids, and we were like their adopted grandparents, and it was great and wonderful. And yet we had three kids on the West Coast we hardly saw twice a year. What will you do with your one wild and precious life? One year and one month after asking that question, I was in this room waiting for you to vote and decide 
what you thought I should do with my one wild and precious life. And the point isn't, you know, what happened there. The point is, every now and then, that's a Christ question to ask. What am I to do with this one wild and precious life that God has given me? And if you don't take the time, the solitude, the silence, the opportunity, whatever you want to call it, to ask the question, then you'll never answer it. Pray with me. Lord, let each of us in our own way find the time not only to ask that question, but to listen for the answer, an answer that may come from within, an answer that may come from you. Scarcely matters which. We pray in Christ's name for Christ's sake and let all God's people say,